reason for th today's public hearing is to take public testimony on the QHP rate filings by Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP. Um, I have not checked today, but as of um, last night, I believe we have received 800 public comments. Um, this hearing is one way to make a public comment. You can also email a public comment or you can um, leave a recorded voice message on our general line at the Green Mountain Care Board. So if you um, forget to say something that you really wanted to say um, today, you still have the opportunity. And um, Susan, when when is public co comment open till? It's open until um, July 20. Oh, no, wait. I'm losing it. Um, do you have the date, Christina? I was going to say July 23rd. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it is Thursday, July 23rd at 1159. But as Kevin may say, we are always accepting public comment. And it also all of that information is located on our website and there is a public comment forum on our website. So this is uh, the first time we've held a public hearing um, via Teams. So it'll be interesting. Hopefully everything goes smoothly and hopefully um, everyone gets through OK. We know that there are pockets of Vermont that do not have good Internet coverage and pockets of Vermont that do not have good cell coverage. So um, again, if, if somehow you get dropped, you lose your Internet, you lose your cell coverage or whatever, you have the other two avenues to uh, make the public comment. Um, I wanted to um, start the meeting because what we learn every year is that there are um, some things that might be able to help someone and the, the proper person to assist you in that is on the line with us tonight listening and his name is Mike Fisher and his staff um, are, are known as the healthcare advocate and they were put into um, statute basically to assist Vermonters to make sure that Vermonters aren't denied care, aren't denied access to care, are getting quality care, and um, they do an outstanding job. So, Mike, maybe you might want to say a couple of words on how people might be able to contact you. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, everybody, for showing up, and thank you, board members, and thank you, everyone, for showing up. This is really important. Um, so yeah, I just want to say again that the purpose of this hearing is for you to be heard. Um, and the Healthcare Advocates Office uh, has a few purposes, primarily for this meeting is to support you in being heard. But we have a secondary purpose that I just want to mention out loud, and that's to support individuals who are experiencing challenges getting the care they need. If we were all in the in the um, in the uh, meeting room in Montpelier, uh, I'd be hearing people stand up and say something, and I'd think, "Man, we should help this person out," and I'd chase after you to try and try and at least let you know about us. Um, since we're not all in the meeting in in one room, and we're in this uh, virtual room, I just want to take an opportunity to make sure you know about us um, and to know how to contact us. I'm going to say our phone number now. Uh, and I can say it again later, and that's 800-917-7787. So complicated. Um, and the fact that, and there are times when we can help people out, there's times when we can't help people out. Um, but the primary purpose of this meeting is to make sure that the board has a first-hand view of what's going on for Vermonters as they attempt to maneuver through this complicated world of healthcare. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for the work that you do on behalf of Vermonters every day. Um, normally, we would have had a sign-in sheet outside the room as you came into the public hearing, but since we don't have that and um, we're doing this all over the internet, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna start at the top of the names that appear on the team's list to go down through those and then for those who are calling in i'll read out the last four digits of your phone number um, no one has to speak i realize that some people may be here just to listen 
Um, and all you have to do is simply say, I'm just here to listen or here to support someone else who's speaking um, if you choose not to speak. So um, we're going to start at the top and we're going to start with Alicia Rodrigue. And I am actually just here to listen today. Okay, well, thank you, Alicia. Thank you for coming. Um, Amelia Schlossberg. <laughs> Hello, I'm at the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. I'm just here to support the HCA and our request for a 0% increase. Thank you, Amelia. Um, ben Palmquist. Kevin, could you please just ask people to spell their names for me? This is the court reporter. Oh, yes, I should let everyone know that you're being um, um, recorded both uh, via Skype, but also a transcript is being taken by the court reporter. And um, I'm sorry about that. And if everybody could, I probably should have them not only say their name and spell it, but say the town that they're from as well. Um, the next person on the list is just listed as Brita. Brita or Brita, B R I T A. Okay, um, I'm going to go to um, Kathy Fulton. Kathy. Kathy, are you on the line? Kathy, we're not hearing you. Um, if you have somehow muted yourself, if you could click on the uh, microphone to unmute yourself. Well, we're not hearing. We're not. Did somebody just say something? We're not hearing from Kathy, so we're going to go to Claire Diamond. Hi, um, my name is Claire Diamond. Uh, I live in Montpelier practice in Burlington. I'm a psychotherapist here in Vermont. It is clear, oh, sorry. My name is spelled uh, C-L-A-I-R-E, Diamond, D-I-A-M-O-N-D. It is clear that prioritizing profits over people is morally wrong and that the high cost of health care already limits access to medical and mental health care for Vermonters. Every day, I directly witness the ways our oppressive systems create and exacerbate personal trauma. I have a sliding scale and most often don't charge for missed appointment fees because I wanna make psychotherapy as accessible as possible for my clients. While insurance companies nickel and dime consumers Practitioner, practitioners who care so deeply about their clients are bending over backwards to provide care. This creates stress and burnout. And in fact, I'm no sorry. <laughs> sorry. What? Kim, you're on mute. Jeez. Was that going too fast? No, that's that's okay. Sorry, Kim. You you did unmute yourself, so maybe you're just pressing it. I did. There you go. Oh, now you're on mute. Kim, you're yes. Oh, now you're unmuted. Okay. So um, you were breaking up. I'm sorry. It wasn't the speed. It was breaking up, and I didn't know if anybody else is having the problem or if it's just me. So, Kevin, this might be a good opportunity to remind folks they need to mute themselves. I think what's tough is I can only mute folks on Teams if they're joined via web. It's hard to mute people by phone. I can click mute all, but then that would interrupt um, Claire or another speaker. So I, I don't wanna do that and cut people off. So if everyone who is on Teams could click on the microphone button, there should be a line that goes through it. That would mean that you're on mute. And then when you speak, you're gonna have to remember to click it again and get that line removed so that we can actually hear you. If you're on the phone, Christina, is it gonna be star six? 
Star six to unmute yourself um, if you're having trouble connecting. Um, but I think if you're on a, if you have a smartphone, you can just mute um, by with the mute button. But again, to unmute on the phone, you do need to press star six. Okay. So Claire, maybe if you could start again, and um, we understand that the internet isn't the greatest everywhere, so. Um, We'll just cut in and ask you to stop for a second if we start to lose you again. So now we're having a problem with volume, Claire. Here, I'm going to press mute. I'm going to press mute all, and Claire, you'll just need to mute yourself. Unmute. My name is Claire Diamond and I'm a psychotherapist in Vermont. It is clear that prioritizing profits over people is morally wrong and that the high cost of health care already limits access to medical and mental health care for Vermonters. Every day I directly witness the ways our oppressive systems create and exacerbate personal trauma. I have a sliding scale and most often don't charge for missed appointment fees because I want to make psychotherapy as accessible as possible for my clients. While insurance companies nickel and dime consumers, practitioners who care so deeply about their clients are bending over backwards to provide care. This creates stress and burnout. And in fact, we know that chronic stress and trauma in turn create medical conditions, which I also personally have and have to pay for. We are in a collective mental health crisis and we need universal health care now. Continuing to raise the rates puts too much financial strain on practitioners and clients and makes care far less accessible. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Okay, um, and I know at some point tonight I'm going to butcher quite a few names, so if I say it wrong, just correct it when you introduce yourself and uh, do the spelling. So next on the list is Cyril Zibrick. Wow, you nailed it perfectly. Uh, my name is Cyril, C-Y-R-I-L, or Cy Zibrick. My last name is Z-I-B-R-I-K, and I'm just here to observe. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril. Next on the list is Dale. Can you hear me? We can. I'm not going to comment again on yesterday. I commented on Blue Cross Blue Shield already. MVP, I, I think I'm just going to reiterate some of what I heard today, which is especially how they are assuming what the trends will be. I understand that they don't have a lot to go on in terms of the you're in unproven territory as far as what's going to happen with COVID. But I was already wondering if things like, is the federal government going to help cover the cost of a vaccine when it is available? Um, to already be talking about charging for a vaccine that isn't even on the market yet, seemed like it was a little Hasty, to say the least. Um, the idea of charging for tr a trend rate that assumes that the backlog is going to suddenly come charging in and there's all these surgeries to be done, it really did feel like they were trying to boost their case for asking for a rate increase that I would say the consumer has far less reserves to absorb than they do to absorb. Um, I think Mike made that point very well in his comments, or somebody did. If you're looking for who can afford what, it's not the consumer. Um, we're really hurting right now. and. So I, I would just ask that you keep that in mind in terms of whatever the rate would would be. Um, 
I'm very concerned that a rate increase is going to mean that people, even if they can afford the premium, based on whatever plan they pick, they can't afford everything else. Um, so 0, 0.0 rate, that actually sounds good for at least one year in terms of supporting the consumer. But that might be too idealistic. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Dale. And I just also want to thank you for um, really following healthcare for a number of years and really listening. And um, it's always great to uh, hear your perspective. So thank you. Um, next on the list is David Barlow. Yes, hi, this is David Barlow. Um, I um, am from a private practice physical therapy clinic in uh, Vermont. And my comment really has to do with reimbursement rates for private uh, providers. Um, we, if you look, go back and look at Blue Cross Blue Shield, we haven't seen an increase in rates in over 15 years. And even though we're paying premium rates, you know, in double, triple digits over those 15 years, we've not seen any increases to what we can re get reimbursed for for the work that we do in our clinicians. What's sad about that is that their rates are even higher than MVP still. So, you know, it, the reality is, is that we're getting squeezed. There's no business in this country that can stay in business without seeing any kind of price increase in 15 years. We've done all we can with efficiencies and driving efficiencies in the business. Um, there's no more to squeeze out of those stones. And so if we're not, if we're not gonna see increases in our CPT reimbursement rates for physical therapy, private clinics just can't stay in business. The last comment that I would make on that is the other sad thing is, is that the hospitals for the exact same work that our clinicians do get paid often three to four times what we get paid for. So the hospitals are collecting three to four times from Blue Cross Blue Shield MVP than what we um, are seeing uh, for our staff. So just really speaking on behalf of our staff, we can't give raises, obviously. We can't, frankly, stay in business. We can't pay utility bills and all the other bills that continue to go up, including our health care bills, if we don't see some kind of increase in the reimbursement rates. That's it. And my last name is Barlow, B-A-R-L-O-W. Thank you, David. Um, next on the list is Deanna Huggins. Hi, I'm Hi. Deanna Huggins. That's D-E-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Huggins, H-U-G-G-I-N-S. I'm in St. Albans, Vermont. I'm here to support the Vermont Workers' Center in 0% um, rate increase. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Next on the list is Devin Bates. Devin Bates. If you're speaking, if you could hit the microphone button to unmute yourself. Well, we knew it wouldn't go perfectly, um, <laughs> but we will get through this. And um, Devin, if you do figure out um, how to get through, if you could just uh, speak up and we'll put you next in the queue. After that is Don George. Don, are you here to listen or? So the next person on the list uh, I know is with the Healthcare Advocates Office, but I'm going to call his name off just to make sure that I, I actually hear from somebody and this is working. So Eric Schulteis. I am indeed here, Captain. Thank you, Eric. Okay, H.B. Lozito. Hey, uh, thank you. My name is H.B. Lozito. Uh, letters H and B. It's my first name. Lozito is L-O-Z-I-T-O, and, and I live down in Brattleboro. Uh, I'm speaking as myself today, not, behalf of, not on behalf of any organization. I work for a small Brattleboro-based nonprofit 
who for many years has worked really hard to figure out how to offer health insurance to our employees. And, uh, you know, going around and around and around, we found it's, it's simply not possible and, and certainly not accessible. Um, before I started receiving insurance through my spouse's employer last year, I was stuck in this challenging cycle. I think a lot of us experience of my organization wanting to increase my pay to a living wage, but then that entire raise amount being eaten up in insurance premium increases. Uh, for years, including now, my deductible was so high that I would never meet it in a single year ever, even when I was purchasing the gold versions of a Blue Cross or Blue Shield plan, um, those that are supposed to supposed to have a lower deductible and a higher premium, uh, meaning that I was paying out of pocket for almost all of my care while I was also paying premiums that were nearly $400 a month. Um, that's not health care. It's not even health insurance. It's, it's not accessible in any way. Um, the rates were deeply unaffordable when our organization was last looking at offering insurance plans to employees. Uh, that was about three years ago, and rates have only continued to go up. Both of my staff members currently purchase their insurance on the exchange, and it, it is a significant challenge and a barrier for them to afford even at their now living wage salaries. Um, I think it's especially cruel to even consider raising rates during a global pandemic at a time when many of us are losing access access to care employers, and at a time when everyone needs um, access to acute as well as ongoing types of primary care. If the mission and role of the Green Mountain Care Board is to, uh, quote, improve the health of Vermonters through a high quality, accessible and sustainable healthcare system, I really believe you're failing the people of Vermont in significant and unacceptable ways. You actually have a chance to get it right this time. Uh, I urge you not to improve these increases. And thanks for the chance for public comment. Thank you, HB. Um, next on the list is James Farr. James Farr. Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I really called in just to listen, <clears throat> but I do wanna echo uh, some of the comments that were made that uh, these health rates are no longer sustainable. Uh, small businesses are, are really bleeding out here. And um, in our business, insurance is the biggest expense we have um, behind payroll. So I also support the 0% increase. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, next is Jessica Morrison. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, hi, um, my name's Jessica Morrison. It's um, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-M-O-R-R-I-S-O-N. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner and a member of Vermont Worker Center. Um, based on my experience and practice, as the insurance rates become more and more unaffordable, um, more and more of us turn to the high deductible plans and either hope that we just hope that we won't need health care um, so we don't either don't get health care we need or if we do we often don't have money to pay the medical bills when they come so the question on my mind is do you really want to be discouraging people to get health care dur during the pandemic um, it's pretty outrageous to me that we're even considering a rate increase um, during a pandemic um, and I'm really tired of public officials pretending that health coverage means that you can get health care and that the Green Mountain Care Board has been protecting the health of companies uh, like Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP over actually taking measures that are going to help us stay healthy. Um, once at the practice that I used to co-run, um, we were checking in with Blue Cross about incorporating um, health coaching into our practice because we had learned that um, Medicare may cover it. So it's just an inquiry. And their representative actually said to her assistant, and I kid you not, we don't pay people to teach people how to be healthy. And so why do we trust companies who don't actually care about us being healthy, trusting the lives of people in Vermont uh, with insurance companies? And I think it's time to stop this unhealthy control that the insurance industry has over our healthcare and our lives. And that the only way to guarantee our right to healthcare is to put uh, the insurance companies out of business and expand Medicaid to all Vermont residents. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, next on the list, I believe, is someone with the Healthcare Advocates Office, but because it's just Jay Shaw, I shouldn't assume it's Julia. Um, 
Jay Shaw, is that you, Julia, or is it someone who wishes? Hi, Kevin. To yes, it's it's Julia Shaw with the HCA. I'm not planning to speak. Thank you. Okay. And also next is Kaylee, also from the Healthcare Advocate, and I assume you're just here to listen to as well, Kelly. No, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to assume. Yeah, that yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I actually don't have the option right now to unmute myself, so just to let you know, but I switched to the computer. Okay. My phone won't unmute but I wasn't planning to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. You do have to press star six, just a reminder. It's different than just unmuting yourself. So Christina, this is Susan. So it's star six on your phone, but if you're on your computer, then you just unmute the microphone. Is that correct? correct? Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, next on the list is Kate Bailey. Hi there, I'm also with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate and just here in support of the 0% increase. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, next on the list is, a, I, I believe she's here in her official capacity as a reporter, and that's Katie Jickling. Um, Katie, have I got her working? Yes, that's right. Thank you, Katie. So next on the list is Keegan Harris. Hi there. Um, my name is Keegan Harris. That's K-E-E-G-A-N Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. I live in North Thetford. Um, and I work as an educator in the Springfield School District. Um, as families like the ones that I serve are considering the implications of returning to school uh, in this time of pandemic, insurance costs should not add to their concerns, nor should public school budgets be tied to the rates charged by private insurance companies. When this board approves rate increases, it is endorsing cuts to the necessary services our public schools provide students and that all children deserve. These rate hikes are a veiled assault on public education. And of course, these increases are a naked assault on public health. They are an endorsement of the continued exclusion of marginalized, poor, and working people from our healthcare system, as some other folks have uh, movingly testified to. Our families, neighbors, and friends will keep going without the care they need to live dignified lives, and sometimes to live at all. It has always been unconscionable to approve these rate hikes. And during a pandemic, it is quite literally murderous. The solution is even clearer now than it was in 2011 when the State House passed Act 48. In the strongest terms, I call on each member of the Green Mountain Care Board to reject these proposed increases. And I call on the governor who appoints you to reject the for-profit model of human health and deliver the public good healthcare system that Vermonters are owed by law. To do anything less further betrays the public trust and further disgraces your private conscience. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Keegan. And next on the list is Maddie Walker. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Um, my name is Madeline Walker, M-A-D-E-L-I-N. Walker, W-A-L-K-E-R. Um, I'm a member of the Vermont Workers Center in Burlington. At the age of 18, I began displaying the symptoms of a chronic illness, pain, nausea, unbearable exhaustion, and my doctors ordered a lot of tests, tests, scans, procedures, each one with a copay that needed to be paid. I've left a multitude of appointments with no answers and barely enough change for parking. At the age of 19, I stopped approving my doctor's requests for further probes and scans because the copays add up when you're going that often. I needed care and a high deductible and staggering copays prevented it. I couldn't afford it, even with insurance. So this is a shortened version of my story, but it should sound familiar because I told it to you last year. 
this has become a kind of annual date standing up in front of you to fight for my right to survive without crippling debt or constant pain. You've acknowledged these rates are unaffordable, but you've been unwilling to stand up to the insurance companies and deny completely unreasonable rate requests. You can't affect a company's bottom line, but you can sit there while your neighbors and your community members come here every year and quite literally plead for their lives. I'm 21 now. I'm supposed to be studying, talking to my friends, and learning what it means to be an adult. And instead, I'm sitting here telling you that I deserve access to healthcare, the healthcare that makes all that possible. I deserve to live without crippling debt. And I'm angry. So I'm going to close with a question. Can you look every single one of us in the eye and tell us that an insurance company's survival is more important than ours? Because that's what you're doing if you approve anything other than a 0% rate hike. Thank you for your time. So Maddie, um, this is a time for us to listen to you, but you, you've raised a, uh, a question and, and I'm gonna give you an answer. Um, and the answer is quite simply that um, this board has to balance and what you've seen in the early days of the Affordable Care Act where insurance companies did not um, charge the right amounts and their medical loss ratio exceeded the premiums that they took in, they stopped selling product on the exchange. And the exchange is the one place where we really need to have product being so sold because it's the place where you can get a federal subsidy to help you pay for your insurance. So um, I think every one of the board members would love to just say um, to the insurers, you're gonna lose money by offering this insurance, but we're not allowed to do that by statute. We would be violating the law that put us in place. And also we would be hurting Vermonters who would no longer have access to federal subsidies for their health care. So um, I, I just want to get that out there. And I know that doesn't help, but um, next on the list is Maggie. And there's only one name, so Maggie. Hello, can you hear me? We can. My name's Maggie, M-A-G-G-I-E. Belenz, B-E-L-E-N-S-Z. So I just want to start by um, responding to that statement that you just had there, um, just because I think if we're talking about affordability, we should be talking about universal health care, and we should be talking about um, taxing the people that need to be taxed in order to make health care affordable, and I think that that's really the solution um, that we all need here in Vermont. I'm a member of the Vermont Workers Center and a registered nurse. For the first three months of the pandemic, I was working on the COVID unit at UVM. Um, it was not easy going to the hospital, not knowing what to expect, consoling family members concerned about their loved ones over the phone who can't be there with them. Being that bedside family member in lieu of family and trying to deliver patient care amongst ever-changing conditions. And it's taken the role of the nurse to another level. So during that time, you expect to be hearing people's concerns about um, this mystical virus and all the, the unknowns surrounding that. But one of my most memorable moments I've had was a man in his 50s whose health was continuing to decline throughout my shift, his oxygen needs increasing every few hours as he lay there faced with anxieties of this deadly illness. Um, and as he was literally struggling to breathe, he started voicing his concerns for the future. And I had been really caught off guard by what he said next, um, which was that but he explained to me that he had been laid off earlier this year um, due to the pandemic. And with that, he had lost his health insurance. He didn't have any idea of how, if he made it through this illness, he was going to pay for his time in the hospital as he was already the primary breadwinner um, in his household, um, three kids at home. And 
as he's legitimately telling me this between gasps, I was shocked. Um, and luckily, behind my PPE, he wasn't able to see my reaction because that's not what I was expecting him to say. Um, but looking back, I've heard that so many times that I shouldn't have been so surprised. Um, and yeah, here's this man. He's fighting for his life against this coronavirus, thinking about how he's going to pay for it. And what it comes down to is that health insurance should not be health. Health is a human right, and it should. The future of your health should not be based on your employment status. It's completely irrelevant. Like that, that connection should not be one. There's all the other countries who have our similar economic status and um, in this in the world are are having universal health care and it's especially now we're dealing with people's lives and it's completely inhumane for insurance companies to even consider raising the cost of health insurance right now the private for-profit industry is not working and this pandemic has continued to magnify that um, healthcare, all of us in the healthcare industry are, are struggling right now. And I think that as a Vermont Worker Center member, we're all calling on Governor Scott and the Vermont legislator to implement universal Medicaid for all. Um, and if this means putting the insurance companies, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, MVP out of business, so be it, because it's morally wrong to profit off people's health and well-being in the first place. And I think that, like, um, I think it was Mike Fisher said at the beginning of this, healthcare shouldn't be so complicated, and we have an uncomplicated solution for you. So please implement at 48, and we can move on with our lives. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you for your frontline service. I. I, I hope that there was a happy ending and the, the gentleman was able to return to his family. Next is Marie Townsend. Yes, hello, this is Marie Townsend. And first of all, I would like to say thank you for your time uh, uh, and giving me time to speak. Can you hear me okay? We can, Marie, thank you. Okay. Um, I live in Middlebury. I am a, a member of the Vermont Worker Center. Um, I used to be a nurse uh, before I became disabled. I was a nurse for tw over 20 years. Uh, I am also now a member of the Vermont Council on Homelessness. Uh, right now, in the state of Vermont, we have 250 families that are homeless. With no insurance. Throughout this pandemic, some of these families that are now homeless, a family member has lost their job. And because of losing their job, they have lost their health care. Mm -hmm. So now the family does not have health care. <clears throat> this, is, this is not, this is not right. Um, when they, when a family does not have health care, they don't go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. They're, they just, and trying to purchase health care privately is just, it, it's not an option these days. It just is not an option. No. If so, if a family cannot afford, cannot afford housing, how are they going to afford health care? Right. And this is where universal health care comes in. Mm -hmm. We need universal health care in the state of Vermont, where everybody in the state of Vermont has health care and that they're covered. This can this is so horrible. These families don't have a home. Yeah. They don't have this, uh, most of them don't have health care at all. This is not the way it's supposed to be. I appreciate your time. Thank you. May I talk? Thank you, Maria. Yeah, have, I have his visitor with me. Is it okay if he says something or no? Sure. Go right ahead. Introduce yourself, please. I will. Thank you for your time. 
My name is Alan Townsend Sr. And I I'm sitting here listening to these people. And I've heard from people before that have gone to your board and pleaded with you people, pleaded, hundreds of them. Why can't you people see that? Why can't you see that these people need your help? But yet the insurance companies, they get what they want. Something's wrong there. That's wrong. We especially, don't, and it angers me that the board is sitting back. I'm not saying you're sitting back. No offense to you, please. No disrespect. You got a tough job to do. I agree. I understand. To, but what I don't understand is these clowns are making money hand over fist. Now, here's another thing. Hospitals that opt into Blue Cross and Blue Shield and MVP, they get paid really well. But the private clinicians, clinicians, they can't. They can't. They try. They try very hard. Now, some, but if they opt into Blue Cross Blue Shield, then they'll get that money. Listen, can we take the money factor out of this? There is human lives, right, especially during the pandemic. How are they going to? And like my uh, uh, my friend just said, there are families on the street. If they can't afford a home, how in blue blazes are they going to afford health care? How? How do they do that? Well, you know, the subsidies and we can go to the government and all this stuff. What if they can't? You're the Green Mountain Board. I'm talking about Vermont, not federal subsidies. Vermont Green Mountain Board can do something about these clowns and stop them. They're already filthy rich off the backs of innocent people who work hard. It is wrong, sir. It is absolutely monumental wrong. Now you can say, oh, he's melodramatic. Fine, you can do that, sir. And I'm not trying to insult you, but I'm being firm. This is wrong. You need to stop these increases. And if they, Blue Cross and MVP and all of them don't like it, then they can go right out of the state on a rail. The state of Maine, about 10 years ago, did the same thing. They had had it with all these increases and increases and padding up their reports so they can get the money they want. Finally, the state of Maine said enough is enough. People screamed about it. Finally, they did something about it, and they kicked them right out of the state. And then they wanted back in. They say, okay, you want back in, but you're lowering those rates. And that is the way it's going to be. I'm sorry. Please excuse, please, on my anger. But this is wrong, sir. This is very, very wrong. And you're on that board, and you can make a difference. Thank you. I'm sorry. My, my approach is I'm from Maine. No, and we're very no apologies necessary, Mr. Townsend. Your passion is uh, showing through. And uh, we appreciate your passion. So thank Sir, you. It's wrong. It's wrong. Yep. Michelle O.D. I'm sorry. <laughs> Michelle O.D. That's the way it comes up. I'm not sure if it's short for O'Donnell or, or what, but um, it comes up as Michelle O.D. Last call for Michelle. Okay, the next name up is uh, uh, first name only, Pam. Pam? Hi there, can you hear me okay? We can. Hi, thank you. My name is Pam Polino, and my name is spelled P-A-M as in Mary. P as in Paul, E-L-I-N-O. And I reside in South Burlington. And I work for a company in Colchester, Vermont. Um, if I could, I'd like to read a short letter to you and then just make a few statements. Um, I'll keep it focused and, and brief. I know you've all had a long day. I have sat in on your last two days of meetings. <laughs> so um, well, I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I, I, uh, I applaud you for the work that you're doing. It's very appreciated. 
Um, so I work for a privately held, uh, uh, privately owned 50 year old company headquartered in Vermont called Pohemus. Um, we have a robust global customer list. We are an exporter. We serve the medical market, civil defense, and many high profile commercial accounts. Um, we're very proud to have a stable business in Vermont for this many years. It's unusual. And our company is extremely sustainable. Um, we have under 30 employees at our headquarters. Um, we are in roughly over 20 countries with global distribution, but our headquarters is small and it's all staffed by local people. Um, we are extremely concerned about the rising health insurance rates. Although the company is sustainable, as I mentioned, the health insurance costs are not for us. Um, the numbers, uh, they far exceed the rate of inflation. We find that the currently proposed rates, um, we've looked at it from every which way, we really find it to be completely unacceptable. Um, I've heard the arguments regarding surplus. Um, like, like I said, I've sat through the last two days <clears throat> to educate myself further. Um, my role is vice president of marketing, but I also serve as the company safety and health officer. So I have a vested interest in this as just as well as a personal interest from a local perspective. Um, Pohemus has formed the Healthcare Action Committee, the HCAC, it's an internal committee. And this committee has conducted research and reviewed a lot of data. And over the past four years, we have experienced health insurance premium increases at the rates on a table that I have submitted to you um, in a hard copy document um, on the public forum. Uh, so you may have seen that. Um, but for those of you who don't have the benefit of seeing it, so in 2017, the health insurance rate uh, it was a 9% proposed. The COLA or cost of living adjustment was 2% and the rate of inflation was 2.1%. Um, in 2018, the health insurance rate was 10%. The COLA or cost of living adjustment was 2.8% and the rate of inflation was 1.9%. Um, I won't go on and read 2019, but you see the trend that we're seeing. I know that you're fully aware of it. But these are the things that we've been discussing. We've been pulling data, articles, what other states are doing. Um, we, we are really trying to hit this from every angle. My colleague, Jim Farr, spoke earlier um, that our insurance now exceeds our payroll. Um, and basically the above, the above rates from this table that we've outlined are simply not in line with any reasonable logical metric um, that we can see. In addition to the unrealistic rate increases, the increased costs have been compounded by the additional increased annual deductibles of approximately $500 per year. Um, the health insurance costs exceed many Vermonters' mortgage, if they're lucky enough to own their house, um, their mortgage expenses, and the Vermont health insurance costs are among the highest in the country. We just feel strongly that we cannot stand for this any longer. Um, we are a very reasonable community oriented company um, and we have really beat our heads against a wall to try to solve this problem. Um, if Pohemus reviews these cost projections over a five and 10 year period and beyond. It's very clear to us that this path is not a sustainable one. Um, soon we feel that we will not at all be able to offer a health insurance for our employees. We have, a, we have long time employees. We have employees that have a long tenure at our company, 20 years, 25 years. Um, this is very unsettling to us from a management team perspective that a small business with under 50 employees, we really feel it's not consistent with Vermont's history and their commitment for supporting small and medium sized locally owned business. And according to the Vermont statute, the intent of the General Assembly was to create an independent board to promote the general good of the state. And that was outlined in several ways. The Green Mountain Care Board role includes reducing the per capita rate of growth in expenditures for health services in Vermont across all payers while ensuring that that access to care and quality are not compromised. Um, it's clear that you all put a lot of work into this. I've sat and listened to your thoughtful questions to MVP representatives, to their actuaries, uh, to their CFO, to the Blue Cross representatives over the last two days. And it's clear that you all have been doing an enormous amount of work on this, um, on this issue. Um, and, I, and I know that you care. <laughs> I, I just, I felt that in the presentations and in your, in your questioning. 
Um, it's our goal as a company to continue to offer quality health care that's affordable for our employees while still allowing our company to remain successful and to stay in Vermont. Um, I've been talking to a lot of other business leaders. I'm very concerned about a couple things. I'm concerned about companies leaving the state. Um, I hear about, oh, well, you know, young people are leaving. My daughter's moving to Boston this Saturday because the opportunities are not here. She cannot find an opportunity. Um, she's a college graduate. She's fortunate enough to have that, but she's she's getting out of the state. Um, so I'm concerned about companies leaving that offer local jobs. I'm concerned about employees leaving companies that they want to stay with, but they can't afford to because they have medical issues or they can't afford the uh, deductible. Um, one thing I did want to pick apart, the Blue Cross had said that uh, their actuary had said that their their costs were in line with MVP. They were asked about why they had so many members leaving. And their comment was they did not think that that was cost caused by cost because they had stated that MVP's rates had went up in line with theirs. That actually isn't true um, because they're not counting the compounded deductibles that they were raising. So that was actually not an apples to apples comparison. I say that with great confidence because we were with Blue Cross for many years and we said no more. And we left last year and we went to MVP. Um, we have looked at self-insured. We have looked at getting creative. We have looked at pooling health insurance. Um, we have really looked at everything. I feel um, really that we've done, we've done our due diligence as a company. We're at our wits end. Um, I'd just like to close with uh, a few remarks that I really we talked about this as a healthcare committee. Vermont is such a leader in so many regards in the state. Um, I saw on the news today, they said that Vermont was leading the way with the coronavirus. Our numbers were, were staying low. And um, people that I know out of state were saying, how, how are you guys doing it? What are you doing that's different? Perhaps they should ask our governor and our leaders because kudos to Vermont, we are doing something right. Um, we're leaders in so many ways. Um, I think we're all proud to be, you know, the, the Vermonters that we do things a little bit different than sometimes the rest of the country. Um, we led the way with Dr. Dinosaur. I think that that was actually modeled for a federal program, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, and I know many people that took part in that, that were hugely benefited from it. Um, so we were a leader in that regard. We're a leader in so many other ways, but we're also a leader in the highest health insurance costs in the country. I think we're in the top three. Um, so I, we're really, uh, as a company, we're, we're really making some decisions right now. And we are very hopeful that we are going to have a 0% increase on that rate. We are not buying what Blue Cross and MVP is selling with their arguments. We do not buy it. We have looked into it and we do not buy it for one second. They have some legitimate concerns there are some uncertainties with COVID. I will agree with that. But I did get a, a, a um, decrease on my car insurance recently because there's not as many people driving. I know a lot of nurses that are working at UVM right now that they're getting called every third night and saying, do you want to have this night off work because we're slow? So those are real examples that I know you've heard. And, um, you know, we're taking, we take everything to, into consideration and we're just very hopeful that we can, as Vermonters, lead the way to just say no more and control these health care rates. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Pam. And uh, um, it, it's really good to acknowledge our state's uh, success so far with COVID, but knock on wood, because just a, few, uh, a very few foolish acts could turn those numbers around drastically. So. Hopefully uh, we will keep staying safe. We will keep socially distancing. We will wear our masks and we'll be respectful to others. So thank you, Pam, and thank you for following the hearings. Um, next on the list is Tim, Tim Yearman. Tim Yearman. Oh, I see he's leaving. So um, now I'm going to start getting into um, just phone numbers. Uh, so you are going to have to unmute yourself. Um, and I'll call off the last four digits of your phone number. And if you could just um, 
say your name and the town that you're from and begin speaking. So first on the list is 9362. Oh, I see they're leaving. Okay, next on the list is 8147. Eight one four seven. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Good. My name's Carla Borland, spelled with a K. K A R L A. Be like Baker. O U R L A N D. I live in East Stetford. I'm sixty seven and retired. And thank goodness for Social Security. Uh, I've decided to speak out tonight, which I've never done. Uh, even though I doubt that anything I or any of us say here tonight will have any effect on the outcome. I mean. After all, your approval of rate increases has given us a 50% increase over the last six years. And I know the Green Mountain Care Board claims that its mission is to improve the health of Vermonters through a high quality, accessible, and sustainable health care system. And I, I believe that, that your, your heart's in the right place, but I don't see how that squares with a 50% increase over six years. And those result in a health care system that's on its face inaccessible and unsustainable. You know, what's the point of talking about high quality health care if that care is out of reach of our most vulnerable community members? I mean, each year this board listens to public testimony and it overwhelmingly opposes rate hikes, calls for the implementation of Act 48. And then every year it seems to be even more clear that this hearing is really nothing more than a token gesture, kind of designed to meet some sort of requirement, like to give the public an opportunity to speak out. No real serious intention to be swayed by anything that the public contributes. I mean, every year this board expresses compassion for the plight of the public and it claims that it claims to serve and, and yet it continues to approve rate hikes that the people of this state by the board chair's own admission can't afford. I mean, whatever the state of Vermont spends to support the Green Mountain Care Board, it's too much to spend on a rubber stamp. We can just go down to Staples and get a giant OK with a red ink uh, ink pad. Please, please prove me wrong and make your actions match your words and reject these rate increases. And please take immediate action to implement Act 48. Thank you. Thank you. 0509. 0509 0509 So I'm going to go to the next number 4436 Can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, hi, my name is Ellen Schwartz. I'm calling in from Brattleboro, and I actually submitted a testimony um, through your website. And what I'd like to do is um, read a testimony from another person. Her name is Wendy Levy. She can't be here because she's working right now. Um, sure, so Ellen. She spells, thank you. She spells her first name W-E-N-D-Y, and her last name is L-E-V-Y. Um, and this is her testimony. Uh, my name is Wendy Levy, and I live in Brattleboro. I am currently on Medicaid, but I was on an MVP plan in the past. I am not exaggerating when I say that I'm frightened of earning more money. My two part-time jobs recently granted me raises, and I'm terrified that when I report my income change, I will be a few dollars over the Medicaid limit and have to return to MVP. But I need this extra income, as meager as it is, because without it, I won't qualify for an affordable apartment. However, with this raise, suddenly I could be faced with premiums, deductibles, and co-pays that I can't pay. This will limit my access to health care. I've been here before. A few years ago, when I was a full-time worker, I chose MVP's silver plan. It was so expensive that my family had to help me pay my premium at that time. Whoever calculates the premiums is clearly quite ignorant of the actual cost of living here in Vermont. I could have chosen the bronze plan, but the deductibles were so high it seemed like having no insurance at all. 
And sometimes the silver plan was like having no insurance at all, too, like when MVP refused to pay for a follow-up mammogram recommended by my radiologist. What? They want me to get breast cancer? And since when is MVP my doctor? Last year, the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board admitted that these rates are unaffordable but claimed that we can't put a company out of business. Well, it's hardly my problem if MVP and BCBS can't come up with a sustainable business model. Who will care about whether I am put out of business, so to speak, because I can't afford to go to the doctor? Too big to fail is a poor excuse for propping up a failing business on the backs of regular working people. MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield don't offer any better service than they did in 2014, and we shouldn't keep giving them raises to reward their mendacious behavior. Let's scrap this crummy system, 0% increase, and fund universal health care through Act 48. Thank you. Thank you. 0276. <laughs> Zero two seven six. Are you speaking to me? I'm zero two seven five. Um, well, it says zero two seven six on my computer screen, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, I tried to, I was in the meeting on my computer, but you didn't call on me and maybe it only showed a phone number and I wouldn't have any idea what what um, phone number my computer used <laughs> to call you. So you probably called me and I didn't realize it. And then I just dialed in. So now I'm kind of hearing you in stereo. I'll try my best. So this is Ann Zimmerman. I'm from Guilford. Um, I did not get a chance to testify in person last year um, when this issue came before the board as it does every year because I couldn't get out of work that day. But I have driven to Montpelier to testify multiple times in the past and each time I let you know that I was a low income single head of household who was purchasing health care on the exchange with a subsidy but that I barely scraped by and that your continued approval of increases in the rates would price me out of a policy. Um, and I'm basically here today to let you know that you succeeded in doing that. You have priced me out. Um, I have a son who's 26 as of close to a year ago and can't qualify to be on a policy with me anymore, even though he is still actually my dependent. Um, my daughter is living more or less independently as a grad student at UVM. Um, I said, go ahead and apply for Medicaid on your own, be an independent. Um, so good for her. I'm glad she can apply on her own. That is absolutely the best insurance. Um, but as a single working adult, working full time, I just cannot afford the premium that is now expected of me for a very mediocre bronze plan, um, which is a plan that could still leave me with expensive that I couldn't afford even if I could pay the premium. And I actually found out that I didn't have health care about a year ago when I used an urgent care place to make sure that I didn't have strep throat. I didn't want to go spreading that around work. Um, you know, and it, it turns out I didn't, but that visit still cost me something like $260 for the 20 minutes or so that I spent with a nurse who told me to go get some over-the-counter allergy medicine with Sudafed and take a bunch of ibuprofen. Um, I actually did think that I had insurance when I went there. Um, I paid them the $20 copay and I later found out that my insurance had been canceled because I guess I paid them too late one too many times. I had used up the grace period, so it was canceled. Um, I did try re-enrolling during the open enrollment last December and that's when I found out that there was actually nothing affordable for me anymore because I was in a new category as far as the exchange went. Um, and just mind you, my life overhead actually hadn't changed at all. <laughs> um, I do recall you making a statement after the last batch of increases were approved as they are to some extent, more or less every year. Um, you said, and I know I'm paraphrasing here, um, well, I know this isn't affordable. We know this isn't affordable, but we can't be putting an insurance company out of business. So here we are when the board that was created to make sure that Vermonters had universal care actually sees its role as making sure the insurance companies are doing okay, even if it means that Vermonters are not okay. And I'm here to tell you, we are not okay. <laughs> We're in a pandemic, you know this, many people have said it. I work in a retail environment in Southern Vermont where we regularly have visitors from other nearby states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, many other places. I'm in my mid fifties and I don't have health insurance. 
I'm lucky. I've been more or less in decent health. Uh, but again, we're in a pandemic. I'm afraid I don't really know if I'm healthy because I can't actually go see a doctor. There's basic numbers I should know that I don't know. Um, I just had a cousin a few years older than me die of an undiagnosed heart condition, which totally freaks me out. I don't know, that couldn't be me. Um, the pandemic only complicates the situation, um, but the situation exists anyway. Um, if there was ever a time to get Vermonters universal coverage and to stop worrying about the profits of the health insurance companies, it's now. Um, I do wanna thank you for you know the chance to give you this testimony. I, I really hope this time you'll listen to the people instead of the number crunchers for the insurance industry. Um, that's all I have, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. 8501 8501 8501 Okay, we'll move along then. 8326 8326. 8326, last four digits. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, uh, my name is Diane Villani. It's D I A N N E Villani, V as in Victor, I L L A N I. I'm in Burlington. Hello. Um, I, I am a nurse practitioner. I used to have my own practice actually with um, Jessica who spoke earlier. And um, I've been just appalled dealing with both sides of the insurance issue, but I know that today we're talking about the consumer my, side. My to, were plugged in that they couldn't hear me. Um, so, you know, it was my experience as a, uh, as a provider that it happened very often that my patients thought they had coverage, um, knew that they were paying ridiculous rates for those coverage, and then would find out that, that they had these deductibles that meant that they essentially don't have coverage. You know, like to, to pay the amount that Blue Cross is currently asking for per month and then to have to pay thousands of dollars out of pocket on top of that means that these people don't have health insurance. They can't get health care. So this idea that we have to keep the insurance companies in the state to protect people to make sure that they can get health care, they're not getting health care. It's not happening because they can't afford it, even if they can afford the ridiculously high monthly payments, they still can't afford to get health care. So if the, the Green Mountain Care Board is really invested, if, if, they, if you really want to carry out your mission, then we need universal coverage. We need universal care. We need Medicaid for all. Um, the, it's, the only, it's the only reasonable thing. So, it, I mean, it sounds like your actual mission, the mission that you're carrying out is really not the one that's stated on your website. Um, and it breaks my heart. It absolutely breaks my heart to see how many patients are struggling because they are not getting health care, even if they have insurance. They are not getting care. Um, please, please, why are we protecting insurance companies? Why, why are we not following through with Medicaid for all? That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for the, your time. Thank you. Um, just to clarify for everyone on the call, the Green Mountain Care Board does not have the statutory authority to put in place any type of program like Medicare for All or Medicaid for All. That would have to be okay. something done by the legislature that's, and the governor. Yeah, that's okay. I understand that. So then just don't approve the rate increase. 
because Thank that you. would move things along. Zero okay, percent, next, please. Thank you very much. Next on the list is 2349, 2349. Can I um, get back on? I'm 027, 0, 0276, and I was having trouble unmuting myself earlier. Sure, go ahead. We you, we were lucky okay. to have somebody that had 0275 that thought it was them. So, so. That's fine. It works for me. <laughs> um, go ahead. My name is Laura Wolf. I live in Wilder, and I'm a member of the Vermont Workers Center. Um, I am going to re repeat what everybody's saying is get the insurance companies out of the way. And I loved what the last person said. 0275 <laughs> that um that by denying them the rate hike that would move things along i think that's a great idea i think we have act 49 uh, we need to defend it um health care is not health insurance um health insurance is a business that does not provide health care it's funnels money for for a price and um we want health care we want universal health care so thank you for letting me get back on and thank you for listening i hope <laughs> thank you thank you so much yes, okay so we're going to go back to two three four nine two three four nine hello my name is ike mulqueen duquette that's i-k-e M U L Queen hyphen D U Q U E T T E. And I was not going to speak, but I kind of got set off by something that you said earlier about how if we don't, essentially, if we don't approve the rate increase, that the health insurance companies may no longer provide care of certain types on the open market. I don't remember the exact details, but. The idea that our health care could be held hostage by these institutions that have a financial incentive to not provide care is atrocious. And it's not as though we can sit here and say, act like we don't have another option. We have a very clear other option. And I understand it's not the board's job to pass legislation, but I do believe it's part of your mission to make recommendations to the legislature. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but at the minimum, we need to not include increase the rates, and beyond that, uh, we need to have a message loud and clear that Vermont needs Medicaid for all. And we have, I was there last year and I was there the year before while rooms full of people spent two hours saying exactly this. And uh, I thank you for the work you're doing, but I need you to not approve the rate hike. Thank you. Thank you. 2590. 2590. Hello? Yes, go me? ahead. Yes. Hello. Um, my name is Griffin Shumway. That's G-R-I-F-F-I-N-S-H-U-M-W-A-Y. Um, I want to start by mentioning how disappointed I am with the board's ability to allow people to participate with this hearing, with, the new, with this technology. The idea that you would roll out something so untested that many people who have come here to testify have been so silenced by the board because the board didn't bother to check the system before using it. You knew this was a popular hearing. You knew that there would be a lot of people here wanting to come on, wanting to testify, and it's frankly shameful that you didn't test the system ahead of time. Now, I'm with the so Vermont Just before Center. you continue, I want you to know that we've been using this system for all regular board meetings, all rate review hearings, and other meetings. What I said at the beginning was that this is the first time that we've used it for a public hearing, because obviously we would much rather do this in person. So please don't take from my words that this is an untested system. This is the best system that we have to use right now. Okay. Well, I'm going to continue with my testimony because I know you can hear me, but I know there's a yep. lot of people who are able to speak today. Now, I'm with the Vermont Worker Center. I'm the Health Care is a Human Right Campaign. I live in White River Junction. 
Um, and this is at least my fourth year attending this board hearing. Um, uh, in the four years that I've been here, four years, um, the only time my pay has actually increased was when I got a new job, a new position at a new workplace. Um, besides that, I haven't received a real raise in years, um, but my healthcare costs go up every year. Fundamentally, this means I'm making less money this year than I did the year before or the year before that. Um, this year, Blue Cross Blue Shield is asking you all for a rate increase of over 6%. This is on top of the rate increases they received the year before, the year before that, the year before that, or any other year that I've been here to testify about these rate increases. This is criminal. And for all the people who die because they lose access to health care, this is murderous. My community cannot afford the rate increases, and neither can our state. In 2011, Vermont passed a law guaranteeing, guaranteeing health care to every resident and making health care a public good. This law created the board you're sitting on today with just the intent of implementing this public health care system. Instead, the board has helped develop the ACO system that funnels health care dollars off the private corporations and has overseen rate increases that so far outstrip average people's raises that most people are making fundamentally less today than they were in 2011. Last year, this board chair, Kevin, um, said these rates are unaffordable, but at the same time, we can't put a company out of business. And I'm asking why. When the role of the Green Mountain Care Board was precisely this, to put an end to the system that puts profit over the lives of our community, the lives of our friends, and the lives of our family. In fact, this is what we're calling for. This year, Kevin, you said that uh, you must ensure that there are many insurance products on the market. But our experience, what you've heard today, what you heard last year, the year before that, the year before that, is the system, that system that you're defending is fundamentally killing us. I can't count the number of people who are not here today because they've died from lack of access to health care, and their lives are on this board's hands. It is precisely the time to put an end to rate increases, an end to co-pays, deductibles, being turned away. It is an end to the profit in the healthcare system. This is precisely what we're calling on you to do. It is outrageous that during a global pandemic and a global financial crisis, the board would even consider granting rate increases. More than ever, the time has come for the governor, for the legislature, and for this board to abandon market-based insurance and continue forward with universally publicly financed health care. And we're calling that system Medicaid for all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am going to now uh, reach out to Christina, who has been texting me, um, to say that there are people that have come into the hearing um, since we started. Um, so, Christina, uh, if you're on the line, if you could um, let me know who those are. Yes, I um, sent you a list, but it may have changed. So um, I and I've been. Where did you send the list to? On your email, which I know you are looking in a million directions right now. So <laughs> I was hopefully I was trying to do this efficiently, but um, there are folks who have been chatting in the um, Teams chat, and I, I do want to mention a few things before. Um, I know it says in the Teams chat that people have been removed or added. That's a Teams thing. No one is removing people from this meeting. Um, I would not do that. Um, and I just want to make that clear because some people had confusion. Um, and then, like I said, some people have been added and this list is in alphabetical order. So if you um, came on late and you're at the top uh, and Kevin made his way down the list, um, we will get to you. Kevin, I'm happy to read those names if you'd like. Um, I think you're going to have to, Christina, because I do not have an email from you. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, we heard from um, Ann Zimmerman, um, and I think the next name is Austin Carmone or Carmone Austin. Carmone Austin. Okay, we could always come back if you want to mention something in the chat. I can um, look at that. And then Becky Lewandowski. Hi, I'm just observing today. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Coleman. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. I'm Bill Coleman from the town of Newark, Vermont. Um, 
I would just like to comment for one thing on uh, the way in which these rate hikes are really um, supporting uh, popular misconceptions on the part of uh, middle income um, Vermonters that um, they live in a welfare state that is um, has a disproportionate share of tax money going to support really um, low income people um, who are getting free insurance while they themselves are, are getting forced to pay for extremely burdensome um, high rates on their own taxes. And um, really, there's a failure of the um, news media. There's a failure of um, information systems that are available to people. And there's really a failure of the educational systems to point out how income inequality in this country and in this state is driving this entire situation where it is really um, there's so much money in the hands of so few people and so little left for either middle income or low income people that um, it seems as though this um, these rate hike increases are just doing just what um, these elites that run this state and run this country um, want them to do to just um, divert attention and to polarize um, the um, vast majority of the population into um, different camps where those that are receiving state run insurance and those that uh, state funded insurance rather and those who are receiving um, private insurance as I, as we've been saying um, exorbitant rates so um, any further rate hikes are, are just um, absolutely outrageous um, the rates are so high already. We can't even be perpetuating the system that we have on hand. And um, as we've been hearing um, from Griffin and from others, the, the best thing that could happen would be if these insurance companies just went under and um, we could force the situation to um, really take a look at human needs and um, human rights, of which healthcare is a primary human right. There's intense suffering and um, pain that's associated with people who have um, extraordinary um, health care needs and really complex medical problems. They've all come about as a result of a system that puts profits ahead of people, whether it be um, the ability for food processing, um, massive corporations to um, add all sorts of additives to foods that end up driving people right into the health care system with really expensive needs um, to be cared for for um, for terminal illnesses and things that are really caused by food products that should never even have been sold. Our whole system is set up for profit completely, and there's no reason why the healthcare system, which is where these people end up, should be just another um, facet of this um, profits before people system. So I'd say absolutely zero percent. There's no possible justification for any rate hike whatsoever. The best thing, again, would be for the um, insurance industry itself when it comes to health care just to collapse i believe people people need insurance on their homes and things but um, when it comes to insurance for health care that is an unreasonable thing that should not that is completely unjustified it should be um ended just as rapidly as possible and um th these um their ability to charge the rates that they've been charged is um, something that should be really looked at um, as just being completely unethical, unjustifiable, and um, all previous rate hikes that have taken place are, are just um, tragic mistakes that, as, as I've said, are driving the polarization that's taking place in this country. And um, we've got to just um, put a stop to it right here and now. Thank you. Thank you. Christina, I did uh, receive your email. And uh, if you could monitor anybody that comes in, um, in addition to this list, I'll go down through and call the uh, remainder of the list. So next on the list is just the initials C V E, C V E. Sorry, I just want to say one thing, Kevin. I was asked to remind folks that if they've joined by phone, uh, they need to unmute star six. Um, and if they've joined via Teams, just press the microphone button. If you ha are struggling, you may need to hang up and call back in um, if that has happened to a couple of folks. So I just wanted to say that because I was asked to uh, remind people that's how you can unmute. OK. So one more time for CVE. Hi, I'm Cheryl Van Epps, and that's spelled C-H-E-R-Y-L. 
V-A-N-E-P-P-S. I'm calling as a brain injury patient, um, a survivor, and um, I, I'm calling to testify. I also submitted my comments um, just, I think it was last night, to the board, so you have that also. Um, I want to add to the comments, and thank you for everybody who's been telling their patient stories. It's very difficult to do this. Um, I've been trying to at the hospital level, and um, it's been very difficult for me. It's, it's traumatic. You come home realizing that they are not listening and no change is being made. So I just want to say that. Thank you for, for your efforts there. Um, I, I wanted to add that in my case, uh, I felt the effects of the corporate influences on the hospital care as far as patient efficiency of flow through. Um, I was booted out of my post-op bed too soon. And as a result, I my implant was displaced and I had to have a second surgery to fix it. So I saw the effects of trying to maintain a business model and uh, run efficient um, process of care delivery and what that means on the human level. So uh, cost cutting, my doctor's appointments, uh, I have to wait a long time to see. And some of my specialists that have left the, the region, there's no replacement. So I'm going without care. So um, those are some of the effects of quote unquote cost savings programs. Um, you may not see it as a um, effective way to use the money, but for us, sometimes those are absolutely necessary. And I believe that's not being taken into account. So basically, I'm here to say the quality of patient care is really suffering, that um, patient safety is being effective, and uh, again, quality of care. So what we're paying for, I, I came to the conclusion that I was doing more for myself as do-it-yourself care, uh, researching what I needed and how to get, go about getting it. So I was taking care of myself to recover from my brain injury. Uh, and I felt that I didn't need the insurance. So I've dropped it as of December and I'm going without, so I'm one of the uninsured right now. So um, I just wanted to contribute that, that you really need to look into what we're getting for that money that we're paying into the pre as premiums. And I feel that um, the quality isn't there. So thank, thank you again. Oh, and one other thing, I researched the qu quality and what the definition of quality is. Um, if you'll go to the um, Institute of Me Medicine 2001 report, crossing the quality chasm, they defined qu quality of care basically as timely, coordinated, individualized, comprehensive, meeting whole person needs. So I would like you again to take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, next on the list is Cynthia Teague or Tig. I'm not, I probably butchered that, but Cynthia. Hi, everybody. It's Cynthia Tai. Um, I live in Jeffersonville and I'm a member of the Vermont Workers Center and Vermont NEA. And I simply want to state that raising insurance rates, health insurance rates, and a pandemic is just despicable. Uh, healthcare is a human right to reiterate what Mr. Coleman and many others have said. It's profits being put ahead of people and it's immoral. Uh, as you know, the Vermont teachers were just forced into the first iteration of a vested high deductible 
uh, convoluted third party payer involved plan. Uh, we're just getting our hands around that. And now the rates are going to raise. Uh, you know that uh, with the pandemic, school funding is, is going to be an utter mess. There's going to be layoffs. Uh, and, you know, to speak to, you know, the needs of the students in my community, you know, I find it very laughable, you know, that you say that you have no hand in the ability to facilitate universal health care when the fact is if working people cannot afford uh, their insurance, um, they're going to need some kind of health care coverage. It breaks my heart to hear that in this day and age, we still have people walking around without health insurance. I don't know how people involved in the system can sleep at night uh, with that happening. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say tonight. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Cynthia. Next on the list is just the first name, Dan. Dan? Is Dan on the line? Not hearing Dan, we're going to go to Victoria Jarvis. Victoria Jarvis. Hi, everyone. My name is Victoria Jarvis, J-A-R-V-I-S. I'm with the Department of Vermont Health Access. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I wanted to say thank you for holding the meeting in Microsoft Teams. I'm hearing impaired, and this platform has closed captioning on it, so you can do a, a you can have closed captioning really easily on this. It's already attached to the program, so really grateful for that. And I'm also very grateful to just listen today, and I respect the stories that the Vermonters are telling us. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, next on the list is um, Michelle O D. Michelle O D. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, um, my name is Michelle O'Donnell, um, O apostrophe D O N N E L L. Um, I live in Burlington and I'm a member of the Worker Center. Um, I wanted to um, first say thank you to everyone who has shared their stories and experiences um, and also echo the calls for universal health care. Um, it's a model that works and centers people's needs over profit. Um, and over the ex continued existence of um, companies. And I also wanted to say that by, um, you know, holding these hearings and still, you know, hearing all these moving testimony and still going ahead with the rate increases, um, what you're telling us is that you don't believe our stories and that you don't care about our stories and that you don't believe the economics that show that universal health care is the, the cheapest option um, and that your priority is with maintaining the status quo in these companies over, um, you know, providing health care um, and, you know, respecting people's human rights. So I think that um, it's outrageous to consider um, increasing or approving these uh, insurance rate increases in any year, but this year in particular. Um, having seen how, um, you know, so many people have lost their jobs and need to find health insurance outside of that. Um, no one should have to fight for their health care or to afford their health care. Um, and health care is a human right. And, you know, universal health care is the answer, but not approving these increases is, um, you know, the bare minimum first step. Um, so, you know, I encourage you all to take that step. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, next on the list is Kate Bailey. Kate Bailey. She already spoke. She's with the HCA. Oh, thank you. Uh, Kate Canelstein. K-A-N-E-L-S-T-E-I-N. -E Kate.
Going to go to Keith Bruner. Keith Bruner. Um, hey there. Yes, I'm here. Um, Sounds like uh, you have a little one in the background. We do. We're wrestling with him right now. Um, yeah, so my name's Keith Brunner. Uh, it's B B R U N N E R. Um, and I'm currently on Medicaid. Uh, I've been working per diem uh, for a few years, and in the past, I've been on these Blue Cross plans that are uh, under sort of direct discussion here. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I support the 0% rate increase, the call for that. Um, I think it's even worth considering returning to the original rates from 2013 before they raised up almost 50% in the past few years. I know it's probably not possible, but it's worth putting it on the table. Um, I think that uh, returning to, as Pam was talking about the before, the purpose of the board, promoting the general good of the state, and among other things, improving the health of the population um, is important. Uh, in the statute, uh, and I know that for the duty, uh, the duties of the care board, in terms of rate review, um, you all are considering both the underlying statutes about the general good of the state and the health of the population, as well as the uh, it says protecting solvency of insurance companies. It's right, right in the law, and so it seems like it. You know, it's really at the discretion of the board to weigh these two considerations, which are directly opposed. Um, and so it's kind of a political choice, I think, for the board of are, is the board going to promote the general good of the state or the solvency of these private companies um, at our expense? And, um, you know, I would just encourage uh, the board to use the pandemic as a fresh start, uh, an opportunity to demonstrate to the public that it's a strong, independent regulatory body that takes the side of the people. Um, I think if that sends Blue Cross and MVP into fiscal insolvency, um, that is an important thing for legislators to deal with. Um, I think that the private market-based health insurance system, it's pretty clear, is uh, both immoral and economically untenable. We have the law on the books uh, down in Montpelier to transcend that and move to a publicly financed system. Um, and just the last thing I would say is, um, I think an elephant in the room is that wealthy people and big companies would be paying more under a publicly financed system than they do under a private market-based health healthcare system. And so, um, you know, in a way, I think the, the board is faced with the, uh, the question of a political choice of promoting the general good of the state and improving the, the health of the population or supporting the interests of sort of a small section of the population uh, and a particular industry. And I, I know it's not just the board, it's also the, the lawmakers. But just to sum up, I guess I would encourage the board to uh, have a 0% uh, rate uh, increase for next year and um, and to really figure out how to put pressure on the legislature to, uh, to deal with this mess and not keep kicking the can down the road. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Next on the list is Karen Saunders. Hi. My name is Karen Saunders. I that's S A U N D E R S. Can you hear me? We can, and we can see you as well. Oh, what do you know? Okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> I must be real. Okay, I'm in Brattleboro and a member, another member of Vermont Workers Center. Um, many years ago, when I was in my late teens and early twenties, I worked in a small factory in Massachusetts where my wages were barely above minimum wage and I couldn't afford health insurance. Then I got a letter in the mail inviting me to participate in RAND's health insurance study, which maybe one or two people on the call have heard of. For the first time in several years, I could afford to go to the doctor, get desperately needed dental care, and even get new glasses. Sure enough, the study concluded the free health care made it possible for people to get the care they needed. Unfortunately, that didn't result in the universal publicly funded health care that would have allowed all of us to get the care they need, we need. Today, here in Vermont, as we've heard today, we have neighbors who still can't afford health insurance because of these astronomically high premiums, which, as we know, have risen far higher than wages have risen. This is, as others have said, unconscionable at any time, and particularly so during a pandemic. I urge you not to allow any rate increase. Further, I urge the Green Mountain Care Board to join us in calling upon Governor Scott and the legislator 
culture to do the right thing, to do what should have been done several years ago, fully fund Act 48 and send the insurance companies packing. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Next on the list is just the first name, Joy. Joy? Do we have Joy? So that is the last name that I have, but I want to open it up. If I have not called your name and you wish to speak, if you could just start, and if multiple multiple people speak at once, I'll just ask one person to uh, speak at that time. So um, please speak up if you wish to um, give us your input tonight. I, I, I am 8501. I missed my turn. Well, go my ahead now. Grace. Thank you. My name is Grace Bennett, and I live in Brattleboro, and I'm a member of the Vermont Workers Center also. And my story is old because in 2014, I had a serious stroke, which resulted in my <clears throat> losing my home, my job, and all kinds of savings that I might have had up to that point. And the upshot of that was because my employer put us on a bronze health care with MVP and my deductible was $5,000. So for several years, I was unable to be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, which was the root cause of my stroke. So the <clears throat> same story, that was 2014. Now we're in 2020. And I can see things haven't changed. They've only gotten worse because the cost of premiums are outrageously expensive for people. And I too agree that we need Act 48 to be put into put into action. And no rate hikes for insurance companies. If they if they can't make it with the money that they've made so far, they need to get a job. Thank you so much for listening. Bye bye. Thank you, Grace. I heard another voice um, that wished to speak. Go ahead. That was me. I am uh, Roger Arnold, R-O-G-E-R-A-R-N-O-L-D. I live in the Upper Valley. Um, I also work as a public librarian where we work with healthcare navigators to get people health insurance um, from the marketplace. But most importantly, I am a member of the Vermont Worker Center. Um, I think as many people have talked about that when you as the Green Mountain Care Board approve these rate hikes, you are forcing people to choose or compromise uh, on their other material needs, whether it is access to car insurance or access to food, you're forcing people to make decisions um, for them. You're making people, you're choosing the decision for them, right? So often they're not. And we are seeing that with an increase of 50% over the last six years by our calculation, it's very clear that health company, healthcare companies are controlling access to healthcare, um, particularly during a pandemic. I, I don't believe that is right. I'm calling for a zero percent increase as so many others have done so. Finally, I just wanted to point out, I think it's very instructive that in response to someone's healthcare story, all these patient stories that you are hearing, you, uh, Mr. Kevin Muller chose to respond with medical loss ratios and talking about the product that is being sold on the market. And similarly, last year, I thought it was instructive when you expressed an interest in not wanting to put healthcare companies out of business. I think that is very instructive. And so I have a question whose side are you on? As the as a healthcare regulator established through Act 48, you work and a call for the people. And it's very clear that your dual role of a healthcare payment reformer often gets in the way of your ability to advocate for the people. And so I ask, whose side are you on? Thank you. Thank you, Roger. I'm sorry that um, you feel that way, but again, I'll reiterate that if there is not product available on the exchange, then Vermonters would not get subsidized and would be bearing the full cost of whatever insurance they got. And uh, I can tell you that I work with four incredibly talented individuals as the other board members who could be doing other things with their time. And um, 
they're here trying to do the best that they can each and every day, um, putting in the work to try to work within what is legally possible for the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, this is uh, George Cloak in Middlebury. My Go ahead, George. Spelled, yes, my name is spelled K-L-O-H-C-K. And uh, I was glad to hear at the beginning of this uh, two hours uh, Mike Fisher speak. Uh, my wife Margaret and I uh, remember Mike Fisher from the time he was in the state legislature and uh, trust him as a person who has the interests of everybody at heart. I want to just say that uh, after listening for all of the testimony that's been given so far, I, I believe that we live in a state uh, that uh, where people are quite well informed and where people are struggling to find justice and uh, the best thing for everyone. And I uh, was extremely disappointed. I, I applauded uh, Dr. Deb Richter when she came to Vermont to advocate for health care for all. I was extremely disappointed when Act 48 uh, fell somehow. But I wish it could be revived because I think that the only way to end the suffering that is going on for lack of health care and the expense of health care that's beyond reach of so many people the only way to end that is to go to Medicare for all, universal care for all. And someone mentioned the idea that uh, Vermont has taken leadership among many issues ahead of other states. I wish that Vermont again could get in the, lead, in the head of other states and, and move on towards a situation in which everybody had publicly funded health care and everybody could depend on uh, support of everyone when they got sick or were in need and uh, and so forth. That That's uh, my comment. I I, uh, I don't know uh, the political ramifications, what the, what the Green Mountain Care Board can do. I know that we need to speak to our legislators. We need to speak to the governor. We need to elect people who have these uh, ideals in mind and will work for them. But uh, I just want to add my voice to the idea that uh, I'm hoping and praying for the day when universal health care will be a reality where we live. Thank you. Thank you, George. Would anyone else wish to speak at this time? Christina, um, come on, on if you have any other names. I, had, I don't have any, any further emails. Yeah, I don't see anyone, but there can be a lag uh, between people joining in the list updating. So, oh, I do see someone. Oh, that's Hi. just a comment. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead and state your okay. name for the my, record. My name is Britta Fisher, B-R-I-T-A-F-I-S-H-E-R, and I'm calling from South Burlington. Um, first, I would politely ask you not to interrupt me um, and to save comments until the end. If there was ever a moment to take a look at our profit-based insurance system and recognize that it doesn't serve the needs of Vermont communities, that moment is a global pandemic. Every year that this board chooses to uphold a system that makes a profit off of people who need care is another year that we carry on in this way. Currently, insurance rates, both premiums and co-pays, are already too high to afford and discourage people from seeking care. I'd love to hear you defend exactly in what ways our system is currently high quality, accessible, or sustainable. Year after year, I wonder what you would need to hear in order to reject a model of health industry. How many stories of trauma and struggle do you need to fill that quota? Over the last six years, you have chosen to increase insurance costs by over 50%. You position yourselves as a mediating body, working to protect the people, and indeed that is why this board was formed. But in fact, you are the ones upholding the current system. I think that it isn't a question of can or can't. It's a question of will and imagination. Let's be clear. A 0% increase in rates is not a radical ask. It changes nothing about how the current system is run or who benefits from it. 
a 0% increase is the absolute bare minimum. We are making this request as a way of stalling one of the many crushing forces that are impacting people as we feel the full swing of the ripples of COVID-19 on our communities. We are here telling you over and over in different words with different stories from around the state that we already cannot afford the care that we need at the current rate, that we avoid going to the doctor despite chronic pain and other illnesses and we're asking you what we're asking is for you not to make it any worse for us right now. I know that your statutory mandate does not include passing legislation, but you could use your power and standing to advocate for a change. Just because something is legal does not make it moral. This country and this state have a long history of immoral laws. What would it take for you to join us in reimagining what healthcare as a true right looks like. A system where people don't have to be wealthy to access care. What do you personally have to lose? I truly ask that you ask yourself that question and interrogate the response. Is that privilege literally worth the lives of the people in Vermont? Because again, this is a moral question and our lives are at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Britta. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak at this time? I would like to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm, my name is Sharon Rakusen, S-H-A-R-O-N-R-A-C-U-S-I-N. I live in Norwich. I'm a member of the Vermont Worker Center, and we are a big organization, and we have been pushing back for years after all the testimony I have heard over the years, after all you've heard, if you cannot change this paradigm, then I have to be strident. I think you need to resign. The board needs to step back and say, we cannot do this. You're living in a bubble, in a privileged bubble. And you have heard from people from across the spectrum, from every, uh, income level from professional people, from business, a business that I heard from tonight that I thought was be, would be doing really well, like, you know, making bombs <laughs> and the military complex, and they're struggling with health care. What don't you get about this? It's really upsetting. I want you to stop the charade every year listening to us and join us. Like Karen Saunders said, and I also wrote down, like, join us and say to the governor and the legislature, you know what? People are, most of the people in this state are struggling, professional people, people who are living in poverty. Everyone, every single person cannot deal with the rate increases. We've been helping our family with co-pays and deductibles for years for just family you know, issues. And, you know, you can't do this job. If you put as much, if you could put as much effort as you are into the ACO, into giving us, into changing this paradigm, you would be doing yourselves a favor and you should feel good about that, but you can't feel good about this. So I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how much more I can take of your goodwill you're very nice to listen to us, but you're not making any changes. I oppose not only this rate increase, but every single rate increase from this moment forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would wish to speak at this time? I would, Halton. yes. Go ahead. My name is Alan, I'm Alan Townsend Sr. My question to you is, are you, you, I take it you're the chairman of the Green Mountain Board? That's correct. Now, my question, there's four members on this board. Am I correct? That's correct. There's five members total, myself and four five. others. Yep. Four others, all right. Now, my question is, why isn't the rest of the board here? Now, I understand. They, are they introduced themselves. Oh, they, are there. they are here. Are they they all introduced with themselves. Um, you have Robin Lunge. You have Maureen Yusufer. You oh. have... Jessica Holmes, and you have Tom Pelham 
And they all introduced themselves at the beginning of the meeting, sir. I must have missed that. I apologize. But um, I, I just talk, I got to quickly tell you something. I know you people are busy. I know you can't weave magic wands and get things done. That That's unrealistic. But there's a hospital in Virginia, and I can't remember the name of it. It was years ago. I was just getting out of the Army, and I was doing some diving with a friend. And I come up too quick, and something happened to my right eardrum. I went to this hospital. I had two doctors. It wasn't a clinic. It was a hospital. And they took care of my ear, and they even gave me the medication for the pain and everything, and everything was totally free. Everything. No bill. Now, if they can do it, why can't that be done here? Well, I understand, I understand the art of politics. I came from a family that was very charged in it. You know, the art of hoi folloi or whatever you choose to call it. It's a language all of its own. Now, I'm going to speak a language that is going to be very clear. I agree with the last lady. You people need to resign and find new members on there that have heart, that care about the people. I come from Maine, and we're pragmatic people. We don't put up with hoi folloi. These people need to help the people of this state. I'm telling, I'm sorry about my charge. No offense to you, not to condemn you, but you people have the power. Don't tell me you don't, because you do. You say, oh, you know, we're limited this and limited that. No, you're not. You can do, put a stop to these clowns and put that, and, and no more increases. Not during a pandemic. That is very unrealistic. And I don't care about the chairman of the board of MPV and all those clowns that just want to make money greedy off the backs of the people that are killing themselves to keep themselves healthy. I say drop all that, all MPV and all that, drop them, all of them, everybody across the board. I'll tell you what, that'll smack them up fast. That hit them right in the wallet. Thank you. And please forgive me for my charge. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would wish to speak at this time? Is there anyone else who would wish to speak at this time? Kevin, it's Walter. Go ahead, Walter. I'm sitting here at work, so there might be some background noise. Um, my work in the tourist business, I think, you know, we've heard all the testimony I've been listening as I've been working on my phone and I look out at the people here and <clears throat> half of them aren't wearing masks and <clears throat> there's nothing I can do to enforce it. And I wonder what happens if I ever have to go in and get a COVID, another COVID test because of it. And the only thing that doesn't panic me is because I'm on Medicaid and I don't have to deal with deductibles, vast deductibles and co-pays. And I think it's really time that we, the public, we, the board, and <clears throat> really look that we have to start thinking of healthcare as a product that we buy and sell and the plans on the marketplace and all that are ludicrous. I think the time has really come, especially with this pandemic, that, you know, healthcare has to be a public good. Um, I'm amazed that we talk about not letting Blue Cross and Blue Shield or MVP fail when we let so many thousands of other businesses fail. And <clears throat> This, this is just crazy because they know that they can come to us every year and we'll give them more money. They'll come to the board and we'll have more testimonies like these and pretty, you know, we'll have to balance these testimonies against the board, against their rate increases. They always start high. We work down, we play the game. 
Um, so I think it's time we've reached the end of the road. Um, we really have to start looking at it as a public good rather than a plan, rather than, you know, something to sell like a washing machine or a car or an iPhone <clears throat> or paying four bucks to come into a state park like they do here as I watch them. Um, that being said, I know that it takes more on political will. And if there's one thing this pandemic has shown us is that we do have the money that every time we talk about not having the money. And I know the legislature is the one that does that. It is purely balderdash to protect various special interests. And we've all known that for a very, very long time. I know it's not the board's purview on this, but I hope that the board members and <clears throat> Chair Mullen can communicate this back into the pipeline, up into the administration levels, because this is where it's going. Um, if it's, it won't be this year, of course, but we're, we're going there, because pretty soon we're not going to have any more money to give to these insurance companies. And as that Deb Richter had said a couple of years ago, the time has come to ask ourselves whether Blue Cross Blue Shield exists for us or we, do we exist for them? Because right now we exist for them. And <clears throat> I know that this hearing, you know, they'll probably get us, they'll, they'll get a raise and then we'll be back next year and the year after that and the year after that on these raises. So I think we've reached that that bridge. We've reached the end of that road and we have to make that decision. So <clears throat> just maybe it's something to ponder. I don't know. But anyway, I thought I'd share that. And I'm sure you've had a lot of fun listening to us. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. Excuse me, this is the court reporter. What was Walter's last name? What? It's Carpenter, C-A-R-P-E-N-T-E-R. Thank you. 64, and I live in Montpelier. About we don't require the age uh, disclosure, Walter. <laughs> hey, why not? You know, I've been a Green Mountain Care Board groupie for how long? <laughs> a long time. Oh, I'm here when she started. Huh? Is there anyone else who wishes to speak at this time? Could I make one more comment? Uh, I'd like to get whoever hasn't spoken first. Okay. Um, so um, my name is Ellen Schwartz, and I read somebody else's testimony before. And if there's a chance, I'd like to just speak on my own behalf for a few minutes. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my, I spell my name E-L-L-E-N-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z, and I live in Brattleboro, and I am a member of the Vermont Workers Center and I have been attending these forums since they began. I've been at every single one of these forums. One of the things that is really glaringly obvious in the pandemic that all of our health and all of our well-being is connected. So though I myself am now old enough to be on Medicare, and so fortunately I am not personally directly impacted by these rate hikes should they go through, the fact that they leave other people in Vermont without access to affordable Healthcare is a problem for all of us. It's not just about me individually. Every year I come and I hear what I've heard this year. I hear people pouring out their hearts, sometimes in tears, to this board. You hear from people who can't afford insurance, people who forego care because they can only afford a high deductible plan, but they can't pay the deductible, and people who are denied care because we have this Byzantine process whereby insurance companies rather than doctors and patients get to decide whether care is warranted to be paid for. And every year, in spite of all this, the rates go up. Last year, you, um, Kevin Mullen, you honestly admitted that the rates were unaffordable and you, but you added the same thing you said this year, which is that the board felt compelled to raise them in order to keep the insurance companies in business. You are a public board. You're supposed to be looking out for the interests of Vermont residents, and you can't have it both ways. You either do what's right for people who are struggling to pay these exorbitant rates, or you side with the insurance companies. 
it's a myth that we need the health insurance industry. If you're operating from within the system, you may see that as the only option, but I think that we need to think inside a different box. There are many countries that provide health care as a public good. I lived in one of them. In, in the Uni United Kingdom, I lived in the early 1970s when the National Health Service, which still exists, was more robust than it is now. I got great health care. Everything was simple and straightforward, and it opened my eyes to what a health care system could be and should be. Your board was created by Act 48, which was also supposed to bring universal health care to Vermont. I ask that you deny the rate increases and that you join us in pressuring the legislature, legislature and the governor to do everything within their power and your power to get Vermont back on the course to a, the unified and integrated health care system that was called for by Act 48. Green Mountain Care was the name of it, and that's now the name of Medicaid, but it was supposed to be Green Mountain Care for All or Medicaid for All as envisioned in Act 48. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet that we wishes to speak? Not hearing one, the gentleman who wanted to speak a second time, go ahead. Hi, it's me. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, it's Dale Hackett again. I just wanted to comment based on the wonderful community input that I've been hearing, and I've heard a lot of comments alluding to Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP, I, I think I'll go a step further. MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield are failures. When it comes to affordability, that's what these rates support, is the failure within the company. I'm not saying that they don't deliver some successes and healthcare services, but nonetheless, when it comes to affordability, the companies fail. And we continue to support that because the way institutional healthcare works, there's a lot of inertia in it. And it takes a tremendous amount of momentum, like I've been hearing in these testimonies. This is a real community testimony. That's the kind of momentum that could create change. If you can get the people that make the decisions to also create the change, and that's not just the Green Mountain Care Board, that's the legislature, that's the governor, that's an awful lot of people. But if you really want to do it, and maybe COVID's the trigger that will cause it. Seems like you got some good momentum going. If you can just organize and go after it. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield, in many ways, are failures. And that we're reminded of that every time these rates go up like this. That's it. Thank you, Dale. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Kevin, Mike Fisher here. Go ahead, Mike. I wonder if you'd let me um, do a final plug and, and a thank you. You may. <clears throat> um, so um, first off, I wanna just say again, what I said at the beginning of the meeting, that if anybody on this call knows of somebody who needs particular individual help in this crazy system, um, please encourage them to reach out to my office, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. And that can be accomplished by calling our phone number, and I'll say it again, 800-917-7787. I also want to just take a moment to appreciate um, uh, appreciate everybody who's spoken today and appreciate the expression of um, uh, the, uh, expression of outrage and, and appreciate uh, the emotion, maybe is what I mean to say. Uh, and then I also want to appreciate the board. Um, uh, each and every member of the board has um, uh, has sat through a tremendous number of hours in the last two days. I've sat with them for many of them, and uh, I um, appreciate their work. 
is really what I want, <clears throat> want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. With that, I'm going to wish everybody a, a very good evening. Um, again, if anyone um, thinks of something that they wishes they had said, um, you can um, go to our website and submit a written public comment, or you can call the uh, phone number and leave a recorded public comment. And that is open until next Thursday, the 23rd. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, Kevin. Good night. Thank you.